Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, the one, the only, Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Hey there. We've got another week of fun shows behind us. Thank you all for tuning in, uh, spending some time with us. Remember, tonight we have a brand new live show, Tim. A couple of uh, guests are going to be rejoining us. We had them on a few few months ago on Darkness Radio. They're going to be back tonight. For a live Q&A and conversation will continue. I know that there were a lot of listeners who had questions, so make sure you tune in tonight live on our Facebook channel and our social media channels for Darkness Radio Presents. That starts at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. For those of you on the East Coast, it is tonight. For those of you that only listen to the podcast and do not watch the live video stream on Thursday night, the podcast will be available right here tomorrow. Simple as that. Our guest today is Kristen Lee. Kristen is a mental health professional and psychic medium who helps families and their children to overcome paranormal and sometimes demonic entities. She's a former reverend, high priestess of the old world. And I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, but is it Stregarian? Yes. Oh, look at that. Religion and the proprietor of the Bel Air House Afterlife research center she has a new book out called paranormal confessions and uh, i've got the copy of the book right here in my hand true stories of hauntings possession and horror from the bel air house welcome to the show Kristen. thank you for being here today well thank you very much for having me so being a, a a psychic medium is this something that you've always had uh these abilities or or is this something that you worked at training yourself for as life progressed Uh, Well, Dave, you know, I think everyone has them, but it is a work in progress and throughout the years, um, trusting the process and building spiritual rapport definitely made me uh, more susceptible to receiving messages as well as helping the most people uh, when it comes to connecting to their deceased loved ones or just in generally uh, counseling them um, for their life's path. So I think, you know, in a, in a nutshell, we all have that um, intuition, uh, our gut feelings, but really honing in on it and having a strong faith-based system and relying on different um, energies and, you know, universal uh, consciousness to help us fine-tune it and just try to be the best that we can be. But now as somebody who works as a mental health professional, and being a psychic medium, how many people that you come across, if you're comfortable in answering this, how many people that you come across that are dealing with severe mental health issues are dealing with them because of attachments and spiritual connectivity or even dark malevolent forces as opposed to just imbalanced can, you know, uh, brain chemistry? Um, it's very low. The, the, I, the numbers I, I would say are very low. Um, for people that have obstacles, mental health obstacles Mm -hmm. to where they need to, you know, seek mental health professionals. But for somebody that has an attachment and it does make them imbalanced, um, you know, on a scale from one to 10 people, I would say probably two to three, but it is very low. It's very seldom that that happens. Um, But I do my best to help them, um, you know, with positive reinforcements as well as refer them to people that can help them even more than I could. So I do have a very large referral base within uh, my community, uh, the paranormal community and metaphysical communities. Um, And if I feel that I have to refer them, I will. I won't. um, Yeah, I just I don't lead people on. That's just unethical to do that, you know, so. No, I understand. I appreciate that as well. Now, having these abilities, um, when you're talking to people that that have had what you know m- many of us on the outside would look at as a mental health issue, how easy is it for you to discern that it's something else influencing them? And once you've identified that aspect, um, can you can we legitimately or you help release that energy so that the person can go about having a normal life again? Well, yes. And it's difficult because it is a very long time frame. It isn't something that can happen overnight or perhaps a month or two months. It is uh, a work in progress. You know, I do work with um, a registered nurse. And when we do go into different uh, homes and we do that, I really go into residential homes to help people um, 
you know, I always take Carol as the nurse's first name with me and we go through lists, you know, are you on psychotropics? Could it be side effects? And that's when the medical professional comes in, which would be Carol. And we try to correlate and counsel the best that we can and rule out any kind of attachment or supernatural or paranormal first. Um, we, it's it's difficult because we're not family uh, to talk to their medical providers or anything like that. So we don't cross that boundary, but um, it, it, it's just, it's it, every person is different. Um, so a lot of people, you know, like to get more into the spiritual side of things and lean on their faith-based system with a mixture of positive reinforcement and a mixture of metaphysics to, you know, as an example, you know, every morning when you wake up, um, you put some kosher salt in the base of your shower, swish it back and forth in your feet, visualize any kind of negativity that may have been attached to you throughout the day um, going away. And we do know that that is effective for people. Uh, there's other uh, tangible tools that um, we, we, you know, I guess spiritually prescribe for people um, to use so they can further along their journey and, and just mm-hmm. become the best that they can be. But we, we just don't like one and done and we leave them. I do try to stay very close to a lot of the people that I work with um, on a professional level. Um, but, you know, I, I do have boundaries of don't call me after nine o'clock you know? <laughs> I'm sleeping or you know I I, <laughs> I I hope your problems happen before bedtime I get right. that or, or call me the next day I mean there is the boundary set of hours and stuff like that absolutely 100 uh, percent you were you, you hit on something and it flipped out of my head here for a second so I'm trying to regain my my thoughts you said a lot on that last segment but uh the Working with people that have these afflictions and and talk to spirits and and deal with things, you know, to many of us, it would seem, oh, you're crazy, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, even though I've had paranormal experiences, I don't believe everybody all the time, uh, you know, when they reach out to us, because it, it seems that there are other aspects of it. And I know we had a guest on last week that we talked to that was dealing with, he believed, a, a possessed mother. Um, I've First of all, I wanted to mention, Tim, that we've had a lot of great love and support come from listeners around the world. And instead of calling him out as being crazy or just trying to, um, you know, justify the actions of his mother, many of these people feel and understand what his mother was going through. That's a tough, tough aspect. And that this kid was able to survive and hope that we are trying to put him in touch with the people we said we would. We are working on that. So I just wanted people to be aware of that. But Mm -hmm. um you know, I, I like the exfoliation of, uh, you know, standing in the, the 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 salt and kind of helping to cleanse and keep yourself clear of that, which is a great top uh, tip. I think you know we should we could have mentioned on last Thursday's live show and Friday's podcast as well. We were looking for ways to kind of clear ourselves of other people's energy and and things that attach themselves to us. Um, do you feel though that being open? yourself and going into this dealing with somebody that that has a spiritual attachment and dealing with mental issues do you become a target for this is it ever a concern for you yeah absolutely 100 percent. any practitioner and metaphysician um mental health professional or medical professional we are all susceptible to it you know the mailman the you know the swans man that delivers the food i mean if you're walking into a home and energy is energy. If people are radiating on a lower level of energy, negative energy, um, kind of like Winnie the Pooh's um, Eeyore, how he was like, I'm just looking for thistles, you know, that just like that kind of energy. It, it, it can really affect us because a lot of human beings have empathy and that empathy is it it does it is a physical feeling a physical emotion and when you're walking into someone's home or even sitting next to somebody at work you know or to the grocery store and then somebody just unloads on you that can be parasitic And, and that's why it's so important for people to not to forget to spiritually cleanse themselves. You know, we all wake up in the morning and we brush our teeth and, you know, we take a shower, we we get ready for our day. But we also have to incorporate those spiritual um, cleansings into our daily routines too in order to not only self-assure ourselves that we are physically, emotionally, spiritually protected, but also um, 
just know that that is part of our activities of daily living, which can make us stronger. And it also can combat negative energy from actually clinging to us like plaque on on your teeth. It's, 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 it can be as simple as just, you know, metaphorically speaking, going in and brushing your spiritual plaque off of your teeth. It can't be that simple to say it like that. But if it isn't consistent and then someone like you, me, or whoever is trying to help is actually out there and they get a little bit sloppy and like, I'm not going to do this today. And then three days go by and four days go by. And then you start to feel the effects of feeling drained, lethargic, like, oh, let me binge Netflix all day today and let me order my third pizza for the week and not really doing anything. Then that is a problem. And then you have to remind yourself, hey, wait a second. I need to get back into my activities of daily living, of spiritually taking care of myself, whether it be through salt, iron nails, um, hyacinth oil, any kind of metaphysical property that could help you and others, um, you know, really combat those those negative energy energetic forces that the world does provide. And, and it truly is a real thing. It isn't something that even though it is invisible. You can feel it physiological. You can feel it cognitively. And that's something that I think that needs to be educated without, you know, any kind of reservations and to a large community basis. So people can really understand that um, there are ways to self-protect and there are ways to combat different kinds of energies. Have you, in dealing with people, ever felt like you were in over your head with whatever was attached to them, that it was a lot darker, more deeply rooted than you even expected? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's when, you know, I call on my people to step in and, um, you know, get get the most help for the person. Can you share one of those instances? Obviously, I know there's patient-client confidentiality, but are you able to talk about one of the times that you did confront something dark and malevolent attached to someone? Uh, yeah, there was a um, man that had made a phone call and he um, was, he, he had problems. He had, uh, there was alcoholism, there was some drug abuse and um, he lived alone. Um, he, he was, he was alone in the house, but there was an elderly person that was not well at all and bedridden and he wasn't able to leave. So that was part of it too. But he believed that there were, uh, demons in his house. He called them demons and he had said some of their names and even saying names like that can give it power. You know, a long time ago, there was an old saying that I picked up, you know, um, what did not speak it into existence. And that's what a lot of people don't under, understand. Words are very powerful. So with him even saying those words, and there were times, you know, I had a few phone conversations with him, uh, just trying to get an assessment on, you know, is this guy access one, two, three? Yeah. It, 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 you know, I even asked him his medical history and his, um, he wasn't taking his medicine that was prescribed to him from his mental health professional, um, his psychiatrist. He wasn't, he hadn't seen the psychiatrist in months. So I knew that there was some med adjustments that needed to be done, but he was unable to um, admit himself in for stabilization in a crisis unit or anything like that because he was the one that was responsible, responsible for the person that he was caring for that was bedridden. So it was a very tough situation. Um, I did feel because it, it, I was so split, Dave, I, I was so torn. It was like I was a pendulum swinging back and forth on this one and I had to go with my gut. So I did refer him to the paranormal clergy. Um, and then after he was referred to the paranormal clergy, they took over from there. So that's um, how I did that, that particular situation. Well, now talk to me about the Bel Air House. What What is the Bel Air House and what is its history? Well, right now the Bel Air House um, is an afterlife research center. I went ahead and uh, coined it as that in about 2017. Um, but what, what happens at the Bel Air House is, uh, you know, paranormal teams, paranormal enthusiasts and researchers, um, they can actually come to the Bel Air House to to spend a few nights there, uh, collect data, afterlife communication data, uh, paranormal investigations. Um, a lot of people, when we have like events and stuff like that, uh, we try to keep it small, like private events and things like that, where some people actually come to try to connect to their deceased loved ones. And we go into that as a therapeutic um, coinciding with afterlife and paranormal um 
so they can also like hear their spirits maybe in an EVP in real time or, um, you know, if we use different um, ghost box and stuff like that, we, we try to connect to their deceased loved ones and so they can actually hear them and get confirmation and perhaps heal. Um, that's my approach to it. But I know that a lot of the paranormal community, you know, they do their little high fives when spirit does speak and all that good stuff to prove that there is life after death or at least collect the data to support it. That's part of what we do. But the history of the Blair House is very large. Um, you know, the house was built in 1847 by a prominent coal miner named Jacob Hetherington, and he came to Bel Air, Ohio from England. Um, he worked with uh, Captain Fink, who was a very famous man in our area who ran all the industry up and down the Ohio River. And they also worked with the founder of Bel Air, Jacob Davis. They were all abolitionists. So we've learned that the Bel Air House was a safe house. We've just recently learned that within the past few years. Um, and I will tell you, the research is still ongoing. We learned new things uh, a lot, uh, things that we didn't know. Um, it's also part of um, the Underground Railroad. There is a coal mine that the Belair House sits on top of, which was Captain Fink's, who and then he sold it to Jacob Hetherington. And then Jacob Hetherington became a very um, prominent citizen of our community and became a coal mining tycoon. He was a, he was a millionaire, you know, throughout his days. Um, there was uh, the history also consists of the French and Indian War. So there were Shawnee caves that were behind the house and they did some ceremonies behind the house. Uh, there is a death that I know of that is documented in the Belair house and it was Jacob Hetherington's granddaughter lied. And when he transitioned, um, he left his business and all of his monies to his son, Alex Hetherington. But unfortunately, Alex Hetherington was committed to a lunatic asylum. They said that he had epilepsy. And, you know, if we look throughout history of Catholicism and paranormal, we know that epilepsy was once considered possession. But right. with med medical science and further advancements of the mental health industry, um, we know that that's not true now. So, um he was when he was committed to the lunatic asylum uh everything went to lied and it unfortunately alex made some pretty bad business decisions and they went bankrupt so then lied inherited the rest of the like physical properties but there was no monies um for her and she actually lived inside of the blair house with her brother edwin now a strange thing about a piece of research that we found about edwin is that lied um had signed his military draft card. So we're not sure why Lyde would sign it. You know, normally a parent would, but we understand Alex was committed. But where was the mother? And we haven't been able to find a lot of information or research on the mother. Um, but Edwin, when Lyde died in the house, Edwin became very depressed and full of grief. And he put out information for um, modern day, what we would call modern day psychic mediums, to come to the Belair house to try to help him connect to his sister in the afterlife so he could communicate with her and stay close to her. And then it turned out that he became so fascinated with the art of mediumship and afterlife <clears throat> and paranormal, if you will, mm -hmm. he dove into it himself. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot more, but I'll, I'll stop there <laughs> in case you want to say anything. No, sorry, that wasn't it. I, I literally <laughs> just fighting a little bit of uh, allergies here. Oh. And I, I didn't mean to clear it. I usually have my mic <laughs> muted at that time and it just caught me. Um, no, please continue. I mean, that that's a lot of history for one location. So many different archaeological layers to the to the possibilities of the paranormal that take place there. How did you become aware of this location? Well, unfortunately, um, our home was um, destroyed by two flash floods, and we were homeless for quite some time. Um, and I found this house on a foreclosed list, and I inquired about it. And when I went into it, um, you know, I've always wanted a great big house like that, always. Even since I was little, I wanted something like that. And it, it fit the budget. So, of course, we moved in. You know, there was a lot of repairs that we needed to do because it was a beautiful old house, but it was a challenge in the beginning, but we were up for it. Um, you know, but when I walked in there for the first time, I, I did get lost inside of it. I didn't feel any kind of presence or anything like that. And, and that could have split two ways. It could have been like activity was low. Maybe I didn't feel anything or perhaps, you know, I was just 
so focused on getting stability and, you know, and rebuilding our lives that if there was anything that was there, I just probably ignored it. Maybe. Who knows? But um, shortly after we moved in, we, we did start to um, really be concerned about things that didn't make sense. And you have to remember, I, I, I'd like to say this because back in that day, I didn't know that there were paranormal equipment, paranormal TV shows. I never even thought about paranormal. The closest that I ever knew about investigators was uh, Scooby-Doo, you know, growing up with that. That's, I didn't know that, and Ghostbusters, you know, uh, I just recently watched Ghostbusters for the first time last year, to be honest with you. I didn't really understand that part of life. I understood the metaphysical psychic part, but I feel like when you're so displaced and you're in, in, in a psychic is in crisis, there's no reason to tune in. There's no reason to to any kind of messages that you receive, you kind of have to say, hey, spirits, just give me a moment here. Let me get my life together, you know, that type of thing. But um, shortly after we moved in, I did notice a lot of um, odd activity and I blamed, you know, we're displaced. Could this be PTSD? I did a lot of uh, self-diagnosis and uh, blamed a lot of, um, just, just blamed a lot of things other than paranormal until I couldn't. And then that's when um, I realized that the, there, there may be more to this house than than what <laughs> than what I knew, and um, I knew no paranormal teams at that point in my life. So I just did a random Google search on paranormal teams in Ohio, um, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, because we're a tri-state area, and I did find one in Ohio. They were called Ohio Valley Paranormal Research Investigations. They were four hours away. And I um, reached out to them through an email, and I wrote down some of the things that were happening. So. I had pretty strong claims. They didn't believe me. They thought I was crazy, but they still weren't curious and intrigued, and they wanted to come and check it out. And um, when they did come and check it out, they called me a few days later, and they said they had that my claims were not uh, to be dismissed. That they had um, activity. Um, they had, and they showed me a lot of different EVPs. They sent them to me, and they were on the phone with me um, when they sent me the EVPs. So you know, they were very. They were a very cool team. Um, they wanted to make sure that I would process and I would be okay um, hearing one of the particular EVPs that they caught when um, the investigator, Mike McAllister, said, what What do you want to do? Or what do you want with Kristen? And it said, I'm going to kill her. I mean, that's a tough one to, to digest, you know? Um, yeah, that's – well, tough is a very – uh, tame down version of my thoughts on that, right? I mean, how does that make you feel when you hear these threatening – conversations coming through and you're kind of actually being blocked from these spirits, right? Uh, at that point. Yeah, I was, I was totally blocking and shielding and not, not accepting. I was accepting of, of what was going on. I was blaming, you know, psychology thinking that I was crazy. I truly was. Um, but hearing that and, and never ever hearing an EVP through, through a system like that, through paranormal equipment, um, I, I mean, I, it took me a while, a day, days to even tell my family that's what happened. Um, part of me was in disbelief, like, hey, are these guys making this up? You know, is this really true? Like, is this, does this really happen? I mean, I knew that spirit could speak to us, but I never, I always used my gut, my, my thoughts, you know, my, my chills, like my, my, my physical, um, like my physical tools. I never held a, back in the day, it was an old hack shack. I never held one of those. You know, I never even knew what that was. And then now I've got like four of them, you know, and I still, I still go back to the old school equipment when I, when I do investigate, but, um, you know, Dave, it was tough. It, you know, I know tough is an understatement, but it was, it was, it was a very big struggle for me to accept that. Um, but I feel like that acceptance was the deliverance. I really do. And it, it truly shifted my life. That pivotal point in my life completely did a 180 change. And, then I into um, I dove into researching. I dove into understanding, and I reached out to as many people as I could. Um, and unfortunately, and I say that with with a full heart, um, I, I I I wrote a book, a first book called Sixteen Ninety Nine Belmont Street: A Portal to Hell, because I really thought it was a portal to hell. Um, and I wrote it for the next homeowners of the house because I didn't want to live there. 
I didn't want anything to do with it. I did try to run away from it. You know how people sweep things under the rug, but it always sometimes the rug gets rolled back and you have to face it. That's truly what happened to me. I even went into um, a court system and filed bankruptcy on the home and moved, moved away from Ohio and um, got a phone call from the code enforcer of Bel Air telling me to come home to cut the grass. And if I didn't cut the grass, I was going to be fined $800 a day. I told him he was out of his mind. Oh, that's being nice. I told him a whole other curse words too, but <laughs> I won't say those on your show. You know, I was floored that that had happened and that I had to go back and I was petrified to go back. I felt like if I went back, I was going to die. Um, something was going to kill me. So overcoming that traumatic experiences as I have. I've dealt with it. Um, I've had investigators go into that house with me and walk with me in that house to teach me how to properly do an investigation, to collect data, to how to rule things out, to be a skeptic. Um, and, and from that point, um, you know, the Blair House was, was open to the public. And then a very traumatic thing happened to where one of our um, groundskeepers uh, was pushed down the steps and uh, plunged through his hands, went through the second story window, and he was hanging outside the window to where we had to pull him back. And he claims 100% very strongly that something had pushed him. And I believe him because I remember there was a time when I lived there that I was pushed down the steps as well. Something went like on the bottom pack, back of my back like where our kidneys would be, and just forcefully pushed me. And I did fall down the steps. And had our, my dog not been there, I would have gone through that window. So that that feeling, that emotion, that memory, that reflection came back to where he could validate that that for me, that that may have truly happened. And I still say may have because I'll never know. We both will know. No one will ever know. Um, we can only collect the data. And if it continues to happen, then it becomes stronger as in paranormal research. I did learn that from Bishop James Long. Um, and I, I've been working with him for years. I've been working with the paranormal clergy and many different investigators for years and years. Investigators from all over the United States and you know, pre-COVID, different countries. They all come and I pick up ideas for them and I, I watch what they do. Um, I study what they do, and I try to, you know, do my best to to do what they do, um, as within investigating and collecting data. It's tough. It, it's tough. I could talk to you for hours about this. Truly, I could. There's a lot. There's 16 years worth of information um, from the Belair House. Well, we're going to look forward to hearing more about that. We're going to talk in depth about the paranormal confessions dealing with true stories of hauntings, possessions, and horrors from the Bel Air House. We'll do that when we return. You're listening to the best in paranormal podcasting. I'm Dave, that's Tim, and this is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the program. This is Darkness Radio, your home for the best in paranormal talk radio every week. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of the show with us. Remember, you can also hear all of our shows commercial free if you'd like to sign up for Stitcher Premium. $5 a month, that's what it breaks down to. Gives you access to all of our dark hives and our True Crime Tuesday content commercial free. Better than that, when you subscribe, you get all of Stitcher's premium product. So all the thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours of shows that are available are free, commercial free, I should say, to you when you subscribe that way. So if you're looking for commercial free versions of these shows, just go subscribe and use the, the code darkness radio, all one word, darkness radio for some deep discount savings. Our guest today, Kristen Lee, her book, Paranormal Confessions, True Stories of Hauntings, Possessions and Horror from the Bel Air House. So you've tried to walk away from this house, but you just can't. Is that kind of the long and the short of it? That was, yeah, I accepted it and I just dove in as, as, you know, a researcher to research and it truly just shifted my whole life. I do not work in uh, the mental health profession. Like 
you know, I work for somebody or a company or, you know, nonprofit. I don't do that anymore. I work privately and independently now. Um, it has changed. It has it, the, my life completely changed from, you know, the hauntings of the house. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the more bizarre and unusual. You said that you started having experiences pretty quickly into moving into the home, correct? Yes. And now as somebody that was already a psychic medium, what does it mean to you? I mean, I know on the Holzer files, it was interesting working with Cindy Kays of the medium. She would be just floored when she'd get into places that felt like something was trying to keep her from accessing. And it wasn't like she could feel a repellent. She just couldn't tap into any energy. It was like somebody had wiped the data bank clean, but she knew that wasn't the case. She knew that there was, you know, empathetically or, or higher knowledge knew that there was something going on, but it was blocking her. What was that like for you? Is that kind of scary knowing something else could block that transmission? It is. It is very scary. Absolutely. 100%. But I feel like that is more of a protective because it could be overloading. It could be draining. It could, you know, physiologically drain someone if, if they do kind of, metaphorically open that floodwater gate to let all of that energy spirit entities um, come through. So maybe, you know, with this instance with her, with anyone, maybe it's, it's just our guides, you know, our, our ancestors in spirit, our saints, our angels, our deities that are protecting us and stopping us. No, don't do that. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? That's not what you're supposed to do. You know, something like that. Um, but for me, when I was in the house, I just swept that out of my mind. It, if it, if I didn't believe it, it wasn't real. And and I think that was a big mistake for me because, you know, there were times where um, it, the activity became so present, like, hey, we are here. We are in your face. You better believe this. And still, you know, it's it was startling. It was extremely startling. It was so scary. Um, you know, the, the the thing that broke it for me was I was asleep on the couch. Um, my son was on the other end of the sectional and um, we, our dog was with us and uh, my son's father was over on a great big chair in an ottoman. And um, I woke up to the cushion going down, like physically the weight of the cushion going down. And when I opened my eyes and I was fully awake, I saw this gray figure of a man and you could see through him. He was like translucent and you could see the room through him. But I looked at his face and he had no expression. And I screamed, who are you? What, what do you want? Where, why are you here? And he looked at me. Um, it, it was very strange. It was, it was just, it was, it was awful, really. It was terrible because, you know, first of all, when you wake up to something like that, like you wake up, you're, you're, you're alert, you're finally alert, and it's still there then that means it's not a dream. <laughs> and when you start like saying, hey, guys, guys, help, you know, and then the dog's running around viciously barking. And, you know, why is the dog barking? Um, all of it, like a thousand thoughts in your head within five to six seconds. You know, that, that's hard to process at the time that you're seeing a full apparition in front of you. But then when I screamed and I used authority, um, he got up, the cushion went up, he walked out of the living room into the foyer and he vanished and I sat there I could see my breath I actually saw my breath and it wasn't cold we had heat you know it was a house we lived in a house of course we had heat but um you know just sitting there like you're shivering and stunned like a baby bird that fell out of the nest you know that's that's the best way I could describe it and um then then waking everybody up and and when I woke them up you know, Hefe had told me it was it was just a bad dream, and he confirmed that. So I found peace with that, and I believed that. I needed to believe it. I needed to hear that, and I don't think that he was just pacifying me. I really feel like he thought that, but I accepted that, and it took me, you know, days to be able to peacefully fall back asleep, and and then finally, it just you know, it was it was it was really tough. It, it was it was <laughs> that was probably the worst part of actually seeing that happen um, and then being in disbelief. And then finally, when, you know, when I saw, and then this is very difficult for me to talk about because it, it still hurt. Sure. Yeah. And, and the part of it is, you know, talking about it, how are you ever going to heal about it if you keep it alive? But I think that this is important to say, um, you know, I was alone at home 
and um, everybody in the house had gone out uh, to do their own thing. And it was my dog, Bella, and I, and um, I was on playing some guitar a little bit before bed. And um, I went to bed and I securely shut the door. I know I did. That's what I do. I still do that today. That's one of my routines, shutting the bedroom door. Um, but at that time in my life, the bedroom door, all of them at the Belair house had locks on them because I didn't want to hear doors opening and closing all night long because that happened too. Um, but the door swung open forcefully and that's what made me alert. I sat up in bed and um, Bella was again ready to attack and I saw this static electricity energy kind of like a cloud but maybe knee high in, in height uh, coming at me. It was very, very, very staticky. It was black um, energy. It, it was just coming and coming and hovering and hovering. And finally, um, it, it had overtaken me. And um, at that point in time, all I could do was pray, pray for my life, pray, pray to St. Michael to protect. Um, and Bella was again on top of me. Her claws were going into, you know, my uh, collarbones. I, her saliva was on top of my face. She wasn't trying to hurt me, but she knew that there was something that was there and she was trying to protect. And um, I, I, all I could do was move my eyes back and forth. I was stunned. I, I was like, it was like paralysis, right? Where you can't move. But um, the thing of it is though, this entity, I don't whatever it was, I don't even know if entity is the right thing to say. Um, it picked her up and it threw her up against the wall. And wow. I heard her. Sorry. I heard her. I, the, the, the sound she made, I, it, it's, it was shrilling. I'll never, ever, ever forget that sound. Um, and then finally I was broken free. I don't, and I don't know. First things first, I would blame psychology. That's the first thing I would do. But seeing your dog, my dog, my Bella, thrown up against that wall, and she, I, I got up. I, you know, I finally was able to get up, and um, I went to her and I picked her up and I, I grabbed a few things and I carried her downstairs. She's a big girl, um, but uh, I, I left. I put her in the jeep and I left and. A couple of days later, I said, I'm not living in that house. There's no way on God's green earth I'm going back in that house. And we left. The whole family left. Um, and then I went from the beautiful, wonderful, <laughs> huge home to a little two-story kitchen, um, kitchen two-bedroom, living room, bath and a half. It's a very small townhouse. Um, and that, you know, that, that was tough. It truly was. But seeing that happen and knowing that there are energies out there that can physically pick up, you know, a 50, 60 pound dog, throw it against the wall. Well, that was it. I knew 100 percent that I was dealing. It wasn't psychological. There was no way in hell that was psychological and that I had to move forward and first of all, heal from that, give myself time to balance from that. But that's when I, I dove into the paranormal, trying to figure out how did this happen? What are the mechanics? What are the physics? Well, what is this? How did this happen? Why me? Out of everybody in the world, why me? So there was a little bit of ego there, but I, I really wanted to understand it. And that, um, that question, why me? I, I think I have part of the answer now, all these years later. I think it's because um, I am very intuitive. I was not willing to participate in believing in that sense of spirituality. I wanted nothing to do with it. I only wanted to do the positive, happy, fluffy, sunlight, <laughs> moonbeam thing. But we have to remember in life that without the darkness, there is no light. And we have to find that balance. So I was taught a major lesson that there is negative evil entities out there and i had to learn how to balance the positive from the negative in order to help the most people so knowing that all of my years in conforming to the higher norms of academic institutions of helping people with cognitive impairments um and and you know helping them reestablish their lives that wasn't my purpose 
my purpose was to work on the in-between of the physical world and the spirit world and knowing that I needed to build my faith-based system stronger and I, in order to help the most people in this realm and atmosphere and environment of spirituality. I have a, a tough question for you here. And understand, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus at all, but I know at this point, especially hearing what's happened to you and the type of, of, of aggressive activity that took place there, if there is a danger, why make it open to the public? Are you sure you're not being used as a pawn to kind of feed the spirits or the energies there? That's a very good question, and I have thought about that, and I appreciate and respect you asking that. Um, yes, it could very much be that, but I'm not 100% sure, and that's why I call in friends to study that. There are times when the Belair House energy entities are at their peak, and they do harm people, but people know that going into it, and I don't hold any punches with anybody. I tell them, I don't say, hey, there's dangers to suggest something to make them you know, mind trip them. I don't do that. Um, there's a lot of media out there to where they can learn that on their own, which would be suggestive. But you're right. It can feed that. It can feed the spirits in the house. A presence of a human being trying to communicate with any kind of spiritualism entities, deceased loved ones, it, it can they can be used as a pawn. I can be used as the major pawn because I'm the one that's opening the doors for this research to happen. You're absolutely right. I do feel like that, but I also feel like I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to understand why they do it, what are the mechanics behind it, why does it happen, and how and can it be stopped? All right. Well, talk to me about some of the activities, especially when you start using terms like possession uh, that's taken taken place there and tales of horror. What, what are some of the experiences that, that have taken place there aside that lead you to believe possession was an actual activity that happened? Well, I don't feel like it was like, hey, let's call in an exorcist for a solemn rite. I don't feel like that kind of possession. I feel like it was more of being uh, in a trance. There was a paranormal investigator that had been in the house for five or six days, and um, he ended up on the guardrail. He didn't know how he got outside. He didn't remember anything. Uh, he was on the guardrail, and at the same time, his fellow investigator um, had to call the police, the Bel Air police, because um, his car was parked and in the driveway of the Belair house, it was the emergency brake was on. Um, the keys were not in it. Uh, and all of a sudden, his car started to roll backwards and it crashed into the apartment buildings that were, uh, you know, across the street from the Belair house. So he, you know, when he when uh, Dave was up in the window and screaming, your car's rolling, your car's rolling. And then here's Ross on the guardrail in a trance that can't do anything. You know, he, he unlocked, he ran down, he unlocked the door, tried to jump in. He was unable to, to save the car. It was a Dodge Charger, which is a very expensive car for him. And it, I mean, it just, it demolished the side of his car. So we had to, um, you know, the report is he, he had to call the police and the police came and they weren't able to, you know, based on his claims, they weren't able to identify that it could have been just the car rolling backwards or whatever. So there are things like that. Um, one particular, I think I wrote about Ross being um, in a trance on the guardrail in the book, but another one that is definitely in the book is a team came in. Um, they had, they had always come, they were repeating teams. They, they came a few times a year. They were always happy. They were always positive. They were always very close. They were always best friends. And, um, you know, it's submitting themselves to the Blair house for five days is what they was a challenge for them, but they wanted to, to do that, to see what would happen. Um, and I, I discouraged it. I strongly discouraged it, but they wanted to do it and, you know, God love them, let them do it. Um, unfortunately, one of the investigators broke some of the rules in the house, and I didn't know about that at the time. Um, it was passed down to me from other investigators that were there, and, and that's in the chapter Conquer and Divide. One of the um, investigators um, 
just be, his 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 behavior was completely off. He wasn't happy. He wasn't positive. He wasn't cracking jokes. He was actually very mean. He was very irritable. And the things that he was saying to the other investigators was was just vulgar. Um, and then his whole complete affect changed. And he started saying things to me that nobody knew. Personal things about my life that I've never disclosed. I've, I've never even disclosed them to my husband. Um, these are just skeletons that I keep locked up inside of me. And I remember standing by um, the uh, bay window in the seance room, and he was sitting at the seance table, and his eyes were just really strange. I mean, they're just just the look on his face was like, who the hell are you? Wait, who, who are you? And he started saying these things to me. And then one thing that he had said was, you know, don't call cat. Cat's like my, 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 my person, my go-to person, my local go-to person. Um, she's with the paranormal clergy. He said, don't call her. She's dead. And, and I just, at that point in time, I knew it wasn't him. There was something that had attached to him that was probably trying to overtake him. And that scared the crap out of me. I was petrified. I wasn't sure what to do. I knew that there, <laughs> there was a bottle of kosher salt water and a water bottle that I'd made. Um, not, you know, just, I, I threw it at him. I threw the water on him and I started to pray and I started to call on higher powers. Um, and then the investigators came in the room and they're like, what is going on? Is it just, you guys have to stand here with me, stand with me. I think that this is a spiritual battle. I think that, you know, he is, he's not, he's not well, and that something's overtaking him. So we all had started praying together. Um, and then it's just like sun came out, the birds started to sing and it just, <laughs> that was that was a great sound effect. Just as you said that, a bird started tweeting behind you. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, birds. <laughs> yeah, but that's what happened. And that, you know, Dave, that was that was so scary. That was that was probably the scariest incident. One of them that in, that involved other people that I had in the house. And unfortunately, the team broke up. None of them um, communicate with him. Um, the the two teammates were um, family, so they, of course they still communicate with each other. Um, they, they just now, after all these years, have started to investigate again, but they had to take a lot of time off to really process what had happened during their stay. And, and that makes me feel awful. But again, I have to remember, they're the ones that signed up for that. I discourage them to do that. Um, and I helped them to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my physical ability that I could when when things got truly real. Obviously, scary things. Do you? What is the information you're gleaning towards? Like, if you only have one for sure death associated with that home, <clears throat> although the the land is probably rich in in tragedy because of how bloody our past was here in the United States and the things and choices that have been made. Do you believe that you might be working as a conduit that because of your sensitivity, you're drawing more spirits to the house, transient spirits, transient en energies, because they see people are coming there to pay attention? Yeah, it could be. It could be. It really could be. Yeah, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't know. But, you know, with with my psychic practice, when people call me. Um, because of our world, um, you know, not, you know, our world, how it is right now. <laughs> um, there's times where I do receive direct messages from spirit of people's first and last names and specifics. And I state that I've trusted myself and my ear and my gut to say that to them. And it makes sense. It, it makes sense. And, you know, there are some... <sighs> I have proof of that, too, because there's some chat readings that I do. I don't know these people. I, you know, I get a first name. That's it. And um, I'm able, you know, they might say, hey, could you connect me to my father, Joe? Okay, let me see what I can do. And then Joe, what Joe did, how Joe died, uh, other members, family members that are with Joe, first names, all of that stuff comes through. And I, I, I know it's coming from spirit. I know it's probably a blessing. But on the other hand of that, if we're going to talk biblical, it, it, you're very well right. I mean, I could be that person that is feeding it. 
you know, but if it's healing for them and, and they, they receive resolution and they receive peace and they know that their family members or deceased loved ones are in the spirit realm and they are fine and they, they can receive specific information messages, if you will, from them. And that helps them become more enlightened and heals their heart and heals the family. Then you know what? Maybe that's God working through me. Uh, maybe it is. I, I don't know. I just don't know. What are some of the uh, the other more unusual stories that have taken place at the Bel Air House? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of them. I'm just trying to think of some that um, I wrote about. This is a good one. Uh, you know, if you go through all the chapters, it's it's pretty horrifying in the chapters. But um, there is the ending chapter is a story about a servant in the house that was named Gary, and um, we had did a session in the attic of the Belair house where Gary came through. He said his name was Gary. He said his last name was Hetherington. It took me a couple of years to understand what that meant. If he was um, an, an endangered servant, then he would have taken on the Hetherington last name because therefore he would have been an employee as what we would call it or, you know, a slave. Um, but he said that his son was, um, he stayed in the attic. He would leave the attic. He was in the cubby hole with two of his friends. Uh, we didn't have their names. Um, he didn't provide their names. But he said that his son was lured to the attic window facing the northern end of Bel Air. And he um, was lured there by an evil entity and he plunged to his death. And he said that his wife was in the Belair house, her spirit was still in the Belair house, and everybody hid from the evil entity, and they never left the cubby hole. Well, hearing that, <laughs> I felt awful. Like, how could somebody live their eternity in the cubby hole? How could, that's awful. They should be able to, you know, roam in fields of clover and you know, <laughs> go wherever they want, their spirit, right? And I, I felt awful, and I, I made a very big mistake. Um, he said he was from Florida. He said that... Um, I told him, you know, I said that you didn't have to stay here. You don't have to stay in this cubby hole. You can roam around the house. You could go and eat food down at the table. Um, Just trying to talk to him like a regular person, like I would talk to anybody. And then I did the worst thing. I said, you know, you can go with me. And another investigator came through and he said, Kristen Lee, get out of here. He's like, you're too emotional. You can't do this. You just can't. And I said, you're right. I'm so sorry. And I, I left for a little bit to kind of clear that off. And that was, you know, there was a little bit more that happened, but the most profound part of it was, you know, months later, I'm at my apartment in um, a town away called St. Clarisville, Ohio, and I hear the doorbell ring. And I open up the front door, and there's this man on my porch. Um, and he, I live right next to a, um, an OBGYN, uh, a gynecologist that delivered babies. He said that his wife, it was next door. Um, sorry to intrude. My wife's next door. She sees Dr. Sarah, but I'd like to inquire about the apartment below you. And I asked his name. He said his name was Gary. And I took down his phone number and I called um, the landlord to see if they could show it to him. He said he had tried to call the landlord a few times and there was no answer. So I helped him and um, he went on his way. So throughout that day, um, I took my son. My son came home from school, and we were leaving to take him to bowling practice, and there was Gary and his wife that was on the porch again. And I just said, okay, I'll take you out back and, you know, show you. I thought they were lost, you know. How do you get back there? So I showed them, as any good neighbor would do. So we, I, I took him around back, and then I, I said, I hope you guys move in. It would be nice, you know, and I knew she was pregnant. So it would be nice to have a baby in the house because I love babies. And um, he looked at me, and it was really strange. It gave me a little bit of a chill. And then he put his hand on me, and he said, Kristen Lee, my family is eternally grateful for what you've done for us. And I'm just like, I just showed you an apartment. I just, that's all I did. And I said, well, you know, guys, have a good day. It, it was weird, right? I didn't understand it. So I'm driving. My son to the bowling practice, and it hits me. I'm like, oh, my God. That's Gary from the Belair house. And at this point, I don't blame psychology at all because I'm a true believer, right? 
but, but how? How did he manifest in the flesh? Like, how did this happen? So, you know, then I pulled over and I'm, I'm like, I'm in a trance, you know, I'm like so deep in thought, I'm in a trance. And my son's like, Mom, I'm going to be late. Give me, you know, gotta get going. So, you know, I hop back on the interstate. And um, after I dropped him off, I thought, well, if this is really Gary, I think I still have his phone number, right? So I'm going to look in my phone. And if it's a Florida exchange, like, because he told us he was from Florida, from the Belair house, then maybe it's a confirmation that it was him. So, you know, I looked and it was a Florida exchange. And I never called him because I, I just, I, I don't know why I didn't call him. Um, but I know he called Laney and Laney knows that he called him because that, that information's there. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, and then I, I, the investigators that I was with that night, I called them and I'm like, guys, I, 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 I'm not sure, but this is what happened. And we all re- just rationalized. It's just a confirmation um, that he was able to transition fully, find his wife, find the spirit of his child, and perhaps maybe, perhaps transition into a different dimension, or perhaps maybe he was so grateful that he was already in a different dimension, and maybe it was residual energy from him in the Belair house that was actually speaking to us, and that maybe his family did make it out, and he was so grateful, maybe he wanted to know, wanted to let me know. I've never heard from Gary. We've we've asked we've asked in the Belair house, Gary, are you still here? We've gotten nothing, never nothing at all from Gary anymore. Doesn't, but to me that that kind of seems like he's trying to wrap things up with you. That that doesn't to me that doesn't seem like a. You, you know what I'm saying? No. Not really, but no. I would be very interested because I'm still trying to figure it out. So anything that you feel, please let me know. Well, uh, you know, when you, when you, that almost feels like a closure type of uh, manifestation when, when, yeah. uh, w- with a, with a, you know, coming to you and saying, thank you for everything you've done and what you've done for our family. That, that's a, that's a spirit coming to you and saying, you know, basically let's, let's put some closure on this thing and, and I'm moving on. Um, you know, it, it's it's time now for you to kind of move on as well. It, you know, that that's, agreed. Yeah, that, that's yeah. kind of the vibe I was picking up off of that as well. Yeah. It's, do you think that it would be moving on just from that part of it or the whole paranormal thing? No, no, no. Just from that chapter of the, of of uh, your paranormal journey, I I, th- I think it's it's um, you know, it, it, there are, it's it's tying up loose ends in a way. Yeah. Right. And they're giving you that validation. They're kind of there yeah. to when they're saying thank you, you know, and, and putting that through. I just I, like Tim, I'm kind of getting the feel that that was your closure Yeah. on this. With, with that said, though, what do you do? I mean, you know, that's why I'm glad, you know, people ask me, why don't you develop your abilities further? You know, I've had a lot of people say I'm sensitive. I've obviously seen ghosts and spirits. I think it would be too heartbreaking for me to every place I go be open and sensing these things because I want these spirits to move on. I want them to go on. And like you were talking earlier about, you know, people dealing with mental health issues and and such, if they are earthbound spirits, do they retain the debilitating health issues because there's, they haven't crossed over. They haven't cleared that next hurdle. So if you were dealing with somebody with dementia on this side that passes away, does the spirit still retain that dementia or Alzheimer's or uh, or malady, uh, at least psychologically, for that spirit. I feel like they do. You know, they kind of get stuck in in like a record. How it keeps going round, round and round. They get stuck in that. And there are people, and we do that. We don't hold any spirits at the Blair House. In one chapter, um, I did write in the book that there were spirits that were saying, "Free us, free us." And I I ended up in bed for a very long time because we were able to transition over 10 spirits. Most of them were slaves that were in the house and there, the confirmation we have this on a video, um, you know, cause I think we did a live feed, we, um, but we kept it private, you know, so I do have that audio and video, but it, it really happens. Um, you know, there were some that were stuck. They, they really, and that's with any kind of physiological impairment. They really thought that they weren't allowed to leave. That was their mindset. We're not allowed to leave. And if, if you are, you know, say that you were murdered and, and you, because we've had that too. And, you know, you, you need that resolution. Um, it, it can carry over with you on like that in between state to where it would hold you back from furthering to transition to full spirit in, in the spirit realm. 
I, I feel like that can really truly happen. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, right? To to have those senses when when you're doing this and you realize that you have a place that is such a portal, um, like the Bel Air House, and it seems to attract spiritual energy and attract these whether they're transient spirits or just the spirit you know you you clear one layer and another layer steps up so you, you there's more work to be done like you know excavating an archaeological dig for every layer you go down there's another story to be told do you ever feel like you know we should just try to find a way to shut this whole thing down and just let this house finally you know breathe and relax and and be free from this supernatural activity Absolutely. Every day. And I was just telling my husband, I said, you know, after when we get into 2022 and the last team rolls in, I was like, let's just let's take a break. We we all need to take a break. Um, and I think that that that's something that is, is truly going to happen. Um, you know, it's not like the Belair House is a plethora of people stomping in there. Um, we, we maybe have weekends, maybe seldomly once a week. Um, not like on a weekday, somebody comes in, but, you know, people check in on Friday, they check out on Sunday. So, you know, Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, up to Friday evening, the house sits, we don't have anybody come in. I don't go there a lot. Um, I go to sometimes when teams ask me to come down and investigate with them, I will, but I I've learned what I need to know. But I think it's more just for people that are curious and want to know and have that validation and confirmation. Um, that's really why it's there. Um, but I, I, I am really, truly ready for a break. I really am. And I think the house is ready for a break. Um, I did get a phone call this morning. It's a miracle. Never believed this would happen. Um, I did a radio show last week and someone heard it that's a local. He's um, legally blind. And he is from the next town over, and his sister is, um, I believe she's 87, 97 years old, and she actually lived in the house that Jack built, which was the original house where Jacob Hetherington lived. And she, he told me today that she has some artifacts for me, and they'd asked me to come and meet them on Wednesday. So I'm very curious to see what they have to say and um, what these artifacts are. I, I and I, I feel like. If I hadn't done that radio show, maybe there that that wouldn't have happened. That opportunity to meet someone that actually lived inside of the house that Jack built, the mansion that Jacob Hetherington built, right. um, that never manifested. So I, there's, I feel like the Hetheringtons, the spirits of the Hetheringtons, they they aren't always there. They aren't. So, I mean, we could, I guess we could equate that to a spiritual vacation. Like, hey, I'm, I'm leaving the Blair house for a little bit. This stuff's crazy. So we're going to go here. Like in, in the sense, as the of spirit can travel. I do feel that that does happen. I know that happens. I've seen that happen. Um, there's countless data that I've collected to where I can support that spirit does travel. It can go anywhere that it wants to be. Um, you know, they don't want to be in the house. They, they're not going to. There's times where I've done sessions, you know, with Edwin. Edwin, could you please come to the table? Could you please share any information? Could you please share any information with us? And it's nothing. It's just bone silence. And, and that could be split two ways too. And I, you know, I use that term split two ways because there's always a, a and B and C and D for me. There's never just this happened and I believe it. I always try to really peel it back and, and understand the layers of it. It could have been low energy where Edwin had no energy. And energy. I, I, I've got to tell you, what's really kind of unnerving to me is as you were saying that, you heard that music cue up. It was on my um, ECHO. I don't want to say the word or it'll fire off again. But you didn't say that word. I didn't say that word. I was being silent listening to you tell the story. And all of a sudden, as you're talking about calling him to the table and trying to communicate, music just starts playing off of our, our uh, Alexa. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> ah. The Hetherington family, I have a picture of them. They were all sure. musicians. I have a family photo of, of the musicians. Um, Aaron Schreiber and Landon Wells was able to find that for me. Maybe that, I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. Very strange. But, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and it was just creepy music that just started playing. So I apologize for that. When I thought it was on your end at first, and then I'll, mm -hmm. I looked over and noticed my system had lit up and it was blaring. So I apologize. Oh, nope. very strange. 
No worries. Gotta love when these weird little moments happen live on air. Uh, please uh, continue. So in, in dealing with this, you're, you're trying to shut that down. Did you notice during the main COVID crisis, I'm sure it was slow or, you know, pardon the pun, but dead there. Mm-hmm. Did that seem to amp up any spiritual activity? Did it seem like they were getting more restless because there were not people coming? Truthfully, um, I know COVID isn't a positive thing at all, but I looked at not having to go to the Blair House as the most positive and wonderful thing in the world for the, the duration of COVID. But, um, you know, when our governor, DeWine of Ohio, said that um, people could go in groups of six, that's when um, families, like, say dad was the investigator and had the family and they were all quarantined, so they were cool, um, they could come to the Blair House. Um, or, you know, mom or cousin, whatever. But it was mostly families, uh, very seldom teams. And if it was teams, it was teams that um, quarantined and then, you know, drove together and and landed together. Um, so we were busy. We were really busy. But what we did was, you know, here's the code. We put a code on the door. Um, let us know when you leave. We waited 48 hours for them to leave. I had to devise a stay spooky, safe cleaning policy, which was ridiculous um, because everything had to be disinfected. I had to get rid of, um, because, you know, going to the Belair house, you know, you had comforters and pillows on your beds and towels and all that, like hotel stuff, right? I couldn't do that anymore because I couldn't be susceptible to, and we don't know how to, we, at that point in time, we didn't know how we could catch COVID. You know, we didn't know. So I just told everybody, bring sleeping bags, bring your own pillows, um, and just put fitted sheets on the bed and then sterilize the heck out of it, um, of the whole house, the entire house. With You know, it started to be a three or four hour process. My husband and I and, and my son, we had to go in to do all of that. But then after a while, you know, we, we got it down to a science tour. <laughs> it took us maybe an hour, hour and a half to disinfect the whole entire house. And I'm talking about spraying walls, spraying floors, you know, just bleach, disin- and, it was, and Clorox and, and bleach and Clorox wipes and alcohol. That was so hard to come by. But, you know, by the grace of God, I had a friend that worked at the Walmart uh, distribution center and she'd always give me a heads up, you know, hey, truck's here, get your butt here. Um, I got you too, you know, so I did have help. And then families that came in, they brought supplies too. So that's, I mean, honestly, that that was the only way we were able to do that. But um, when it it was quiet, like very quiet, um, we did receive a lot of emails and messages and stuff like that. Could you guys please go in the Blair house and do, you know, live feed? We were hungry. We were, we we just need our Blair house fix. And, um, I said, no, you know, my husband was like, come on, let's just, let's go do it. And I said, all right, we'll go, but we're not staying long. We'll do like 20 minutes and that's it. I just didn't want to do it. I wasn't in the mind frame to do it. I was so, when you go into locations, you got to be headstrong. And with the COVID thing and losing a family member, um, I just wasn't in the right place to do it. So after a couple of days, I got my, my, my brain intact and, you know, had my spiritual boots on and we went in and um the strangest thing happened it really did there's a lady that came through she said she wanted to be referred to as the queen and um then she said she wanted to be referred to as the high priestess and then she started saying tarot cards you know four of pentacles five of swords um stuff like that and i was like we're getting a reading like she's actually giving us a reading and then we looked over in the living room wall and this thing, this shadow, dark, black thing was crawling up the wall. And then I started screaming um, to my, you know, to my people, my spiritual people. And I shut everything down. And I said, Daniel, we got to go. And he was out the door before I was because <laughs> I had to I had to like get, you know, everything unplugged. And, and we just we, we actually fled. This was this was in May that that happened. But it did crawl up the wall. I have no idea what that was. And I wasn't about to figure out anymore. I just knew the next team that was going to come in needed to know about that. And they needed to be safe. And um, I did disclose that to them, but they were a team that pretty, they came on the regular. So, I, you know, I knew that they wouldn't look at it as suggestive. They weren't novice investigators or pretty seasoned investigators. And um, it didn't happen for them, thank God. But, um, you know, it did happen. And that, that kind of 
it shifted things for us um, because, you know, it, it sat and it needed energy. And perhaps we'll never really know that the malevolent, malevolent spirit inside of the Blair House, inhuman, if you will, we can't really prove that ever because it's not going to like come up and say, hey, I'm a demon, you know. Um, but if it is that, then that thing did overtake the house. It, it just, because there was no people there to balance it. There was no metaphysicians. There was no psychics. There were no light workers there to balance that darkness from the light. So the Blair house could have a balance. And that's another thing too, that we, we we're so blessed to have very knowledgeable people come in to balance the energies of the house. So, you know, perhaps, and I'm really thinking hard about what you said, because it's really a good thing to think about, is maybe they are the conduits as well. Um, maybe there's a whole bunch of them. And, you know, with research, too, a lot of people say, like, I've been here before. Why do I feel like I've been here before? This is so familiar to me. Um, and then when they get with people that they don't know, they're like kindred spirits. So I go, how do I know you? I just feel like I've known you forever. Is that past life regression? Is are, are we are we all gathering again? Did were we there before? That's something to think about. And I think about that. I don't try to dive into it because then you kind of go through the rabbit hole <laughs> and you spend days thinking about that stuff, and it can make you crazy. But you know, it's something to take, kind of put it in your put the feather in your cap and and think about it. Not all the time. Don't be obsessive about it. But that's something to think about too. Crazy stuff. And with this house, you know, you said that you're kind of done. You you want to be done with it. Uh, what have you done about selling it? Obviously, there's a new housing market exploding. People are buying like crazy. Do you feel a sense of of title ship to this house, though? Like, even though you don't necessarily want to be there, you don't feel free just loosing it on the world again? Um, two things with that. I don't want the spirits of the Blair house exploited. I feel like I'm their protector and that's not ego. That's the truth. Um, you know, I have pretty strict rules. I I'm super low key. Um, I really am. I'm a private person. Um, and I feel like I've built a spiritual rapport with the Hetherington family, you know, if we're selling it to a family, no, absolutely not. I would never subject a family to that house. Um, selling it to the, somebody in the paranormal, they might say that they're not going to turn it into a demon house. And then, you know, there might be a contract put in place for them stating, you know, by entertainment attorneys that they wouldn't turn it into a demon house, but they would. And, there would be, and then they would exploit our family. They would exploit every piece of research. And who's to say that they wouldn't do it in a negative way? And, you know, if that is the case, and I feel like that's what would happen, no, uh, I will. I will deal with this. Our family will deal with this. And if we need to take a big break, then you know we just close the doors for a little bit. You know, but it's always going to be here because I don't want to risk anybody going in there and trapping spirits, making spiritual puppets to make money. That's not what this is about. I don't like anybody that does that. I'm sorry. I'm no. I'm, I'm being a little bit passionate right now, and maybe a little bit negative. But anybody that does anything like that doesn't have any business in the afterlife research process at all. I I agree with you, and there is a lot of thought to that. Um, you know, and and people should be worried and concerned when you have a location that's known to be a hotbed. Will it be exploited? Will it be, will the spirits there be treated improperly? Will, because it does seem to be a kind of, will they draw more there and cause more issue? Uh, do you feel this is affecting your mental or physical health though, being an owner and being tied to this house? I know we spoke to the former residents of the Sally house, and even though they no longer live there, there are times when they feel the tendrils of terror still reaching out to them from that house. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does affect me. It, it truly does affect me. Um, it does. And, and when, when that happens and um, we all check ourselves, we do. We, we have a system in our home. If we see somebody kind of off kilter, then we talk about it and, and we process it together. That's all that we can do. Um, there's a lot of times where I reach out to clergy uh, for prayer, for deliverance, for things like that. Um it's important to have that that healthy spiritual sense of self um, because the Blair House isn't an easy job. 
you know, it's not. Um, and I just don't feel like it's a job that I could walk away with and have the confidence to know that it would be handled the way that I, I run it. Because I, I run a tight ship. I do. I don't put up with anybody's crap. I just don't. Because it, you, you can't you can't bring Ouija boards in there. Anybody that does. And if you're a Satanist, that's you. I, I don't judge people. But don't bring that in my house. Because that, that's just going to shift everything. Uh, blood rituals. We've dealt with that in the beginning of it. I just couldn't believe people did stuff like that. Um, and, you know, the, it's clearly states on our website and it's been on our website for years. No rituals of any kind, you know, and, and that that's what I'm most fearful about is it slipping in to the wrong hands of somebody. They get careless. They see dollar signs and then they just let anybody in there. And you can't do that. But, yeah, you know, getting back to that, that that's what affects me the most is how how people could be cruel, how people could be cruel to each other. And then how people could be cruel to spirits that 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 need help. I just I don't I can't I cannot wrap my head around that. And sometimes it makes me so angry. And then when I get angry, then I cry. And then after I cry, I get sad. And then I kick a can across the street for a couple of days. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then I snap out of it. So it is, I mean, honest to God, if anybody tells you, ah, now nah, that you know, owning a haunted location, that doesn't affect me. Being in the paranormal, it doesn't affect me. I thought that in the beginning. I'm going to tell you, I did. I was like Joan of Arc with my boots on, going in there like She-Ra. But um, no, it does. And if anybody says that it doesn't, they're a liar because it does. It is a struggle. It truly is. But that's why I cling so, fa- so, so much to my faith-based system and to God. I mean, I... You know, you, you even said in the beginning, a former uh, priestess, high priestess of, this, of, of the Strager religion. You know, that's witchcraft. Let's not be, let's, let's not sweep that under the rug. That is witchcraft. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not. I, I've changed. I, I've changed my belief system. Uh, is it hard to not naturally want to, you know, call on Yamaya or Abatala or Diana? It, it is hard and, and being able to call on Jesus Christ and God, I've had to do that because for me, that's more powerful. That's, that's more stronger um, than, than, than what I have learned. And, and I've learned a lot, an awful lot throughout these years. I know talking to some of the people that have, you know, resided in these places or have had connections, especially ones that have these kind of malevolent, darker forces, Do you ever have a fear that that will be what is the end of you, not natural causes necessarily, but that the spiritual will just eventually wear you down? And again, I'm not trying to sound all dark. I just, Mm -hmm. I know these are the questions my listeners always have after the fact, and and I'd like to try to address them up front. Yeah. Yeah. How much more time do we have? Uh, We could go another five, 10 minutes if it's good for you. You feel free to let us know. Okay. Because this, you're right. You're, you're. You're absolutely right. I am scared. And I wrote about that in my book. Um, I'm scared that when I transition, is my spirit going to be stuck in the house? Am I going to be spend my eternity in the Belair house? And if we believe in curses and hexes, is somebody going to hex or curse me to do that because I left the craft? You know, these are these are real fears. Are they psychological fears? Absolutely. One hundred percent. But they're still fears and they are related to the paranormal. Um, in May, I started to film for a television series inside the Belair house. And, um, by the grace of God, I don't have to do it because, um, there was some paperwork that wasn't in place. Thank God. But I ended up getting an attachment that took me down so hard, so fast. I lost my, I lost my, um, Well, first of all, we were in the basement and there was, everybody smelled sulfur and I couldn't smell it. I just couldn't smell it. Somebody said they smelled like they were in a subway. You know how subway smell smells like feces and urination. I couldn't smell that either. And I lost my taste. And in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, I just got COVID. (laughs) That was my first thought. But then when the session became more intense, I thought something fell from the ceiling and threw dirt in my eyes, but it, it didn't come from the ceiling. It came like straight for me. It didn't fall down on me. It was thrown at me and I did lose my vision and I, everybody left. They left me down there. I was so scared. 
I was petrified and I, I was asking who's here with me, not like instant spirit, but what physical pulsating body is here with me? Is there anybody here with me? And uh, another investigator said, I'm here. I'm here. And I said, where is everybody? And they said they left. And I said, oh, my God. And I started praying inside my head. And I said, you have to go. Said, Don't leave. And she's, you know, she's like, I'm too scared to even move. And I'm like, I started to scream for Mike to come and get me. Um, and he, I couldn't see. I could not see anything. It's like I, I was holding my hands over my eyes. There was something in my eyes. I thought it was dirt that came down from the ceiling. I got upstairs. I started flushing my eyes. Sean Austin had said that I was gray. Um, then I was, I was told to go home, you know, after I flushed my eyes, there was nothing in my eyes. And I went home, I took a kosher saw and actually filled up my hot tub and soaked in it before I went to bed. And, um, I woke up the next morning. I had no voice. So immediately went for a rapid test. I was sure I had COVID and I didn't, I did not have it. So then I couldn't move. It was like somebody had put a stake in my left shoulder blade. So you know how you turn and you can be mobile and you can turn your head back and forth. Right, right. I couldn't move my head. I had to physically turn my whole body to look at somebody. Um, then we had to shoot that night in a cemetery and I, I couldn't do it. I was freezing. I was cold. I was so cold. I didn't have a fever. Then all of a sudden I just became hot. I remember calling Sean Austin on the phone. I said, I need you to say the prayer of deliverance with me. And he says, you know what that means. It's like, you're not going to be able, to, you have to denounce witchcraft. And I'm like, I know, I know. And um, I did. And um, it took me months, right. months to come back from that months. And, you know, I, I did work with Bishop. Um, there was the, the, the lowest point was I was on the edge of my bed. Um, why am I here? What's my purpose? Why am I here? I don't need to be here, right? Like I can transition now. I can, I can take this bottle of pills and transition. And this was not me. This, this is not. I don't. I do. I would never, ever, ever do anything like that. And then the phone rang, and it was, it was Bishop. It was almost like the grace of God was like, okay, here, here comes my angels. Here comes my, my human angels, my earthly angels coming to pull me out of this. It was one hundred and fifty percent oppression nothing more than oppression and it and i was contemplating premeditating not living anymore oh. that's the final goal right to break you that to that point to take your soul yeah paranormal confessions true stories of hauntings possessions and horror from the bel air house Kristen lee our guest the book is out and available we have a link for the book on today's program guide so make sure you click it order the book rate and review the book as well Kristen, thank you so much for being with us today Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Tonight, folks, Dan and Kat Eckhart are back on the show. We had them on in the past. We were discussing uh, seances, occult beliefs, and spirit communication. Many of you wanted uh, more and wanted to be able to interact with our guests and, and had questions for them. So they will be live with us tonight, 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can find it on our Darkness Radio YouTube page. Or follow us on our social media. We will be posting it up there as well. You can join in and listen live or listen to the podcast version the next day. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you for tuning in to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.